Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 12th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, We discuss whether Alaska's economy is on the up or the downswing. The news would make you think we're on the upswing until you read the Anchorage Daily News editorial page. Second, we discuss the significance of Accelerate's recent announcement that they are in advanced discussions about bringing LNG to South Central Alaska. And third, We explain why we think the proposal to merge the two permanent fund accounts, the corpus and the earnings reserve, into a single account should become a campaign issue. And now, let's join Michael. Let's jump into this, Brad. Uh, First and foremost, uh, we got uh, got stuff to talk about here, and there's a couple doozies in this whole thing. So let's... uh, Let's start off with the whole question of whether or not Alaska's economy is it up or down? Is it is it is it uh, is it you know is the economy is it does it matter who you talk to? Is the economy up or down? There's a lot of doom and gloom, and it all starts off with this editorial from the ADN, which I found fascinating for the addition of one sentence. But we'll uh, we'll we'll get started there. Go ahead and give it to us. We'll see, we'll see if it's the same sentence I want to focus on. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Th- th- this week's segment, this week's segment on the economy was going to be was going to be upbeat, right? It was going to be, right. it was going to be the the AEDC, the Anchorage Economic Development Corporation, had their annual lunch, um, and where they released their business confidence index, uh, their report on on how uh, businesses uh, feel about businesses in Anchorage feel about Anchorage. And and the headlines sort of tell the story. It was a it was a positive, positive report. Uh, Alaska News Source News Survey suggests Anchorage businesses slightly optimistic about uh, economic future. Uh, Alaska Public Media Anchorage businesses are optimistic for the future. New report shows the ADN News side. Alex DeMarbin Anchorage construction booming while overall job numbers return to pre pandemic levels uh, data indicates even up in Fairbanks um, there uh, uh, Jomo Stewart uh, gave a presentation uh, to the greater uh, Fairbanks Chamber of Commerce and the headlines for that in the news minor is economics report brings a better than expected outlook not uh, not all uh, roses and and sunshines and kittens but no, nonetheless uh, a positive report uh, an upward looking report from the Fairbanks news minor. So you've got you've got all of these reports and all of these headlines painting a positive picture uh, uh, of what uh, of what various businesses uh, in Anchorage and uh, and and up in Fairbanks are are saying about the state. Then, <laughs> then, then you come to the ADN, uh, the editorial page, and and I you know I think this is telling against all of these other headlines that are positive and upbeat. Uh, here's the edit. Here's the ADN's weekend editorial, the headline for the ADN's weekend editorial with Alaska population forecast to decline. Can we avoid economic disaster? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, okay, I'm starting to get this. I'm starting to get this. 
even if things are looking up, even if there's a positive coming out of the annual AEDC lunch, even if even if the construction forecast is up, even if the employment numbers are up, even if uh, even if Fairbanks is looking is looking positive, by gosh, the ADN op-ed page is going to be doom and gloom because they want to go after their favorite subject. And this is the sentence I wanted to focus on. Down down in the uh, down, you sort of read down through, and they list a number of factors about why it's doom and gloom. And then finally, the state's fiscal uncertainty is perhaps the greatest single greatest factor that will determine whether Alaska follows the path of decline or charts a course of renewed uh, prosperity. If the legislators and the governor persist in stonewalling structural fiscal solutions in the name of paying out a as large a permanent fund dividend as possible, they will not only be ignoring the need for a sustainable long-term plan, but will also foresee deep cuts to services like state public safety and education that are instrumental in maintaining Alaska's quality of life and outlook on raising their families here. No. No, they won't be forcing deep yeah. cuts. Yeah. There, are other, there are other ways. If you want this stuff, and the ADN says they want this, want this stuff, you want this stuff, there are other more equitable, broad-based, better ways uh, to pay for it. Paying a, a, a PFD, uh, taking the money, the portion of the money set aside for Alaska's residents, and, and distributing that as required by statute, still required by statute, never changed statute, uh, distributing that by statute is not does not mean there have to be cuts elsewhere. It just means you have to find other ways to pay for the stuff that you claim you want. You, ADN editorial board, you, Binkley family, have to have to contribute to the costs uh, uh, through broad based taxes. Then they said. Then they said the one thing. The last sentence is one that really, I mean, just convinced me that they're going to take whatever news is out there. And just twist it against the PFD. It's just it's all about all about the PFD in their minds. Um, I used to I had a legal case once where it was it was in the press a lot. Uh, it was in the lower forty eight, and it was in the press a lot. And, and regardless of the fact that that was that was in the hearing, the opposing counsel just took it and twisted it into into a negative. Regardless of whether it was a positive fact, whatever kind of fact it was, he just twisted it and put a negative spin on it. And that's and that's what the ADN is doing. Nobody here's the last sentence. Nobody moves to Alaska for the PFD. They become they they come because of our wide open spaces, natural beauty, and rugged individualistic ethic. They will <laughs> only they will only stay if they can see opportunity on the horizon. Okay, so the PFD reduces the cost of living in Alaska and makes it a more affordable to live here. It gives you it gives seed money to individuals to pursue their rugged individualistic behavior. Right. It, it gives them money to be able to distribute money to be able to live in the wide open spaces and the natural beauty. But, oh my gosh, the ADN doesn't want that. They don't want, the Binkley family doesn't want that out there. They want the top 20% non-resident industries, tourist industries. Remember who the Binkley family, remember, remember the, other the other side of the Binkley family. Tourist industries, the non-resident in the in industries funnel or fueled by non-residents and the oil companies, I want them to have, you know, the, the wide open spaces, natural beauty and individualistic ethic cost free because they want to shove the cost down to the other 80% of Alaska families. So it's, it, it just struck me as really sort of highlighting how out of touch or how centered the ADN editorial page is on finding bad things and twisting or, or twisting anything into a bad thing uh, by, uh, by, by, by comparing the headlines between the, between the positive headlines that otherwise were in the papers, even their own paper on the news side. Um, and then the head, the bad headline that they, uh, that they managed to twist into. You know, what I found interesting about the, and, and I agree with you a hundred percent, but what I found interesting about this whole thing is they spent the first half of the article being pretty much doom and gloom. They're like, oh, there's a bright spot here and a bright spot there, but pretty much here's all the bad things that could happen. Then they spend that's right above, right above the quote that you just made. 
they spend a couple paragraphs are like, oh, well, here's what we really need to do. We need more of this. We need more governmental control of our housing and we need more help in governmental housing and we need more help in the child care sector and everything else. And then there's this one sentence that's a throwaway that stood out. This proved to me more than anything else that this was an article written by committee because it seems like somebody got one line in there trying to make a point that is totally disconnected from anything else. In the paragraph where it talks about specifically about child care, uh, which is, of course, one of the new big issues, right? That's one of the new big issues. We just gave $7 million to it and they want more. They said, while the recent legislation to address child care issues is helpful, it's not enough to fix a structural and deep rooted issue like housing. Again, another thing they wanted government help with. Child care deficit has multiple causes from wage rates and highly competitive labor market to a shortage of training and licenses. And as a recent study found, the true costs of child care are considerably higher than uh, what state funding will cover, meaning we need more state funding. And then this is the sentence. We need a robust economy unburdened by excess government intervention so that wages can rise and workers can afford to pay for their child care providers a fair fee. This entire article has been talking about government intervention in the market as a good thing and why we need it. And they get this one throwaway sentence that one of the committee members of the board uh, was able to get in there, but it's totally out of place with the entire rest of the article. I mean, it just shows me that they are, I mean, it, again, a whole article written by committee where they gave the guy the one, whoever wrote that gets the one sentence <clears throat> and then everything else is we need more government lucre. We need more government dough to make all this happen for that rugged individualistic ethic. We need more government dough for the rugged individualists out there. Um, I mean, it's insanity. It is it's absolute insanity. It is. And 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 that's a that's a great sentence to focus on. We need a robust economy unburdened by excess government intervention so that wages can rise and workers can afford to pay. So we need to take money away from 80% of Alaska families. We need to we need to 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 tax 80% of Alaska families through deep PFD cuts, middle and lower income Alaska families, the ones that are leaving the state. We need to take money away from them. Uh, so that so that we can spend it on other things and wages can rise and workers can afford to we need to make sure they can't afford it by taking money away from them so they so they can't afford it because government will spend it uh, instead on 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 certain things it's um you know sometimes they just get they just get tied up in their own knots trying to find ways to attack the PFD. And that's, and that's all this is, Michael. It's, it's painting a doom and gloom picture against all of the headlines, even on their own news side, against all of the headlines that are talking about the positives in the state and the, and the increased uh, employment and the increased uh, uh, construction uh, jobs. Against all the positives in the state, they, they, they need to twist this around, find the bad thing, uh, and twist it around so it's the PFD's fault. And it's just, I mean, I, I get it, guys. I get it. You don't want to pay for government. You want you want a lot of government services. You want you want child care. You want housing. You want all sorts of things that government the government pays for. You want government contracts. I get I get all that. You want you want high government wages. You want pension plans. I get all of that. But you don't want to pay for it yourself. I mean, that's the part that just that just drives me insane. You don't want to pay for it yourself. You want to push that burden to middle and lower income Alaska families. Only middle and lower income Alaska families. I mean, that's right. right. That's what the PFD targets. That's a targeted tax on middle and lower income Alaska so, families. So well, I got less than a minute here, Brad. So what is the answer? Is the economy up or is the economy down? I mean, it seems like we're on a bit of a rebound. There's some good things out there. But again, the ADN is going to turn everything into a pile of stinking fish. So what, I mean, where are we at? What do you think, really? Oh, I think the economy, I think the economy is rebounding. I think, I, I think we, we're rebounding from a low. So we're not, if you compare it to where we've been, you know, historically in other times, it's not looking that, it's not comparing great, but we're rebounding. I mean, we're, we're coming off the map. We're coming, we're coming back up. People are building things. People are investing in things down. People are, are opening new businesses. And, and I think, I think we're rebound. We're coming off the map. I, the, the ADN doesn't, the ADN op-ed op page doesn't like that though. No, they want that. Again, it's back to that government dependency, right? They, that's what they want. With, they want a dependency state 
to the ADN, the government is the economy. And so that's really what it comes down to. I think Donna points out the one thing, this is a truism that you can find pretty much everywhere, is that subsidizing childcare, housing, college, et cetera, only raises the cost of those things. Anytime something is subsidized, you will watch the cost of it explode. Why? Well, because there's all this free money around it, right? That's what I mean. Look at what happened with, uh, with again, college tuition is the biggest, broadest example of that. The second that they started subsidizing it, uh, you know, college, you know, uh, tuitions increased 400 percent over the course of a handful of years because all of a sudden they knew there was all this free money out there to do it. So crack it up, you know, just crank it up. We'll just make it happen. And that, of course, forces the need for more subsidies. And more so, and it's just, it's this, again, it's a doom loop. It's a self-licking ice cream cone. We're going to see the same thing in this, uh, we're going to see the same thing in this uh, child care issue. We're going to produce it now. And you could already see they're saying, oh, it's just, it's, what did they say? It's just not enough. The, 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 the tr a recent study, the true costs of child care are considerably higher than what state funding will cover. Well, yeah, first of all, why is state funding covering it at all? If the state would get out of it, Maybe we could reduce the cost of it. But instead, the state's involved in every level of it, including all the regulation and everything else. Of course, it's more expensive. And and think what's going on, Michael. It, and it's not just it's not just in child care, but that's a good example. Think what's going on. All right. So we've got middle and lower income Alaska families who need child care in order to have jobs. That's sort of that's one of the one of the rationalizations for it. So we're so we're taking money out of their pockets through PFD cuts, we're taking money out of their pockets to give it back in the form of subsidized child care. And, you know, the top 20% is enjoying the subsidized child care as well. So, and they're not having to pay for it, but we're taking money out of the pockets of these people to afford to, to give it back in terms of subsidized uh, child care. So we're making them poorer in need of even more subsidies to have the standard of living that the state thinks they need. And then, you know, and then as, you, as you're right, as the demand increases and the costs go up, we need more subsidies. So we'll take more money out of their pockets. It's a, it's a vicious circle. I mean, one of the things that, that Matt Berman talks about that I, that I just think is, is, is absolutely correct and fascinating. He says, look, we're, we're, making, we're making people poorer. We're, we're putting more people below the poverty line by taking the PFD than than through any other fiscal step we could do. So we're pushing people down below the poverty line or we're pushing them down below the 130% of poverty line, whatever, whatever kicking point there is for a very for a government program, we're making them poorer, kicking more people into government programs, increasing the cost of those government programs, need and, and as a result, needing more government spending to maintain the same level of programs because we've just Doom expanded loop. the programs to Doom take loop. more money out of people, make more people poorer. It's just, yep. you know, it's just a it's just a constant doom loop, uh, uh, death, death loop that you're that you're creating out of out of doing that when you target middle and lower income Alaska families, which is exactly what the PFD cuts are doing. So it's it's yes, we're increasing costs. We're decreasing the ability, the the target market. We're decreasing the ability of the target market to pay for it, pay for costs. We're increasing the cost, decreasing their ability to pay. So we have to increase the subsidies. So we then take more out of their pocket. It it, it is the right. most right. insane government fiscal policy on the planet. Well, and that's the whole point of the dependency economy, right? I mean, that's what they've done. They created a dependency state. And so that government becomes essentially the center of it all. It's just, again, this spiral, this doom loop, this self-licking ice cream cone. Ice Snare Wolves over on Rumble says, uh, is the economy better or has individual debt just increased? And I think the economy is doing better. Um, yes, individual debt probably has increased, but overall, especially some of the new housing, and you could see some of the uh, talk about some of the new booms that they're doing and construction and stuff in Anchorage and some other things. I think there's some positives. It's not all wine and roses, but it's getting better. Um, and I think, uh, but individual debt has increased <laughs> just like national debt. I mean, we got to learn to live within our means and pay for what we got. That's part of our problem as a society, is my opinion. We're continuing on with a weekly top three. Um, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Number two, we saw it in the paper the other day, this new Texas company, Accelerate, has announced that they're uh, 
in some kind of negotiation for new gas. And I mean, a lot of people saw this as a positive, maybe that some of the emotional ties to the only Alaska gas solution uh, being, you know, put aside that maybe they're actually seriously looking at, uh, and it seems like Chugach Electric is more focused on this than NSTAR, but, uh, you know, that maybe this means that uh, we're actually seriously looking at LNG imports as a solution instead of just waiting around for Alaska gas to magically materialize. Brad, what do you say? Well, I think I think it is a positive development. It's it 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 was humorous to me, to tell you the honest truth, humorous to me to, to see all the headlines about about accelerates announcement uh referring to them as a texas company texas company seeks lng import facility in the cook inlet uh that's the public uh, alaska public media the uh peninsula clarion is texas-based company towns proposed cook inlet lng import terminal to investors and the adn was texas-based company so, so they were all focused on the texas-based company it, it is it's headquartered in the woodlands uh outside houston but it's really an international company uh, in terms of its uh, in terms of its operations, which should give us some comfort, it's um, it uh, uh, is a company that has experience in 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 this industry. It's a company that has a lot of a lot of uh, uh, recent experience, a lot of recent development uh, in this industry, and I think I think it's a it's a positive thing. What Accelerate does is um, not uniquely. I mean, there are other companies that do this, but Accelerate is sort of out at the out in the front. Of the of the industry, what they do is they do floating storage and ga- floating storage uh, and regasification units (FSRUs). And uh, the 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 what that does is you load LNG on a ship, you bring the LNG up to the market that you're serving, and then you hook that ship to uh, an on an onshore uh, uh, gas line. And you and you regas the LNG on the ship. You don't need an onshore uh, regasification facility. It's basically a portable regasification unit. Instead of having to build onshore infrastructure, you rent the ship, and it basically does the work there. And you don't have to build permanent infrastructure on onshore. Right. And and the thing that the thing that I found interesting. Well, a couple of things I found interesting. One, it was Accelerate that the Accelerate that that announced that they were in advanced negotiations or advanced discussions with Alaska utilities. All of the Alaska utilities declined to comment uh, on, on Accelerate's announcement. Accelerate announced it as, as part of their uh, quarterly earnings call. Uh, what you want to do when you do a, when a public company does a quarterly earnings call, you want to, you want to highlight what you've just achieved and you want to identify things ahead that are going to, you know, continue to excite the market and continue to excite stockholders. Um, and so they announced Alaska and a project in Vietnam that they're working on uh, at their at their quarterly conference call. They didn't have to. You, you don't always have to announce uh, projects you're working on. You do that in order to excite the stock market. You don't, there's not a requirement that you do that. So they didn't have to do it, but they did it. Uh, and then the Alaska utilities just sort of just sort of refused to comment on it. So that tells me a couple of things. It tells me that the Alaska utilities really aren't yet quite ready to announce what their going forward plan is. They may have they may be looking at other alternatives um, instead of accelerate. They, they maybe aren't ready to file things with the Regulatory Commission of Alaska and they don't want to get too far out in front of themselves. But it is it is a uh, it is a good development. The other thing that the other thing that it was intriguing was Accelerate and an announced that they were that the, that the negotiations were for them to be the gas supplier, and so they would bring the gas up. They would they would buy the gas wherever they're going to buy the gas, uh, source the gas wherever they're going to source the gas, bring it up on the ship, and then offload it and sell it to the utilities at a, at a delivered price. And sometimes LNG is that sometimes LNG is, is you buy it, you buy the LNG, the, the customer buys the LNG from somebody else and the, and the, and you just have a ship chartered to bring it up. Um, I think that's probably a good thing uh, that they're negotiating with Accelerate for that uh, because it will, it will cut down on the, new things that Alaska utilities need to be doing. Uh, 
You're uh, talking about a delivered price, right? You're right. talking about the negotiate essentially a delivered price where the rental right. of the offshore gas unit and everything else, it's all wrapped up into one price. We will deliver it for X. That's all inclusive. We drive up, plug into your system, give you the gas this much per cubic square foot or whatever. And that's it. That's that's what that kind of pricing is. It takes yep, the exactly. takes the guesswork out of it. Takes the guesswork out of it. And and it also takes the the level of sophistication that that otherwise Alaska utilities would need to develop to to go into the LNG market themselves takes it takes that out. I mean, it's it's sort of like it, it it's the equivalent, frankly, of buying from Hillcorp. It's it's a it's a price that you're getting an all in price delivered into your system, and so you're really all all you really have to measure is whether that price is a reasonable price. Uh, compared to alternatives coming into your system, and I, and that was a, I, I think that's a good thing out of the announcement that that's that that's the the direction in which uh, in which this is going. So, I think it's a positive. If I were the utilities, I might have wanted to highlight it myself. I might have might have wanted to get out in front and do that announcement uh, myself, but well, that may have taken some pressure off of the crisis, Brad. I don't know if we could, I mean, you know, we may need this crisis going into the next legislative cycle. So, I mean, I don't know if we should take any pressure off of that because, you know, we might get something juicy out of that. And the other, and, and another thing, Michael, is they were talking about 2028 also. I mean, the, so Chugach, we talked last week about the fact that Chugach had, had announced that they were looking forward to a, to an LNG solution, a, a supplemental supply solution, uh, by 2028. Um, and you know, we were a little skeptical about that, but, but accelerant is, is talking about the, uh, is talking about the same thing. So I think, I think, I think we're on track here. I think what this demonstrates is we continue to be on track to deal with this. Now, one more time for those in the back of the room who haven't heard us talk about this before, we're not talking about LNG suddenly displacing the entire Cook Inlet. We're not about. We're not talking about the Cook Inlet going away, uh, and and all of a sudden, you know, we're going to be totally supply, totally reliant on LNG. We're talking about LNG coming in uh, to 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 handle the shortfall that's handle that's that's occurring in Cook Inlet relative to the market demand. And when I when I'm starting to run some numbers on this, what I'm doing is sort of factoring in seven to ten percent per year that that as Cook Inlet declines, we're going to have seven to ten percent, uh, an incremental seven to ten percent per year of of LNG coming in, um, and so that's going to that's going to soften the impact on price. Uh, it's going to it's going to soften the impact on you know the concerns about oh my God we're going to we're going to LNG as a as a supply source. Um, and I, th and, and, and for those again, in the back of the room, who haven't heard this before, it leaves the door open much more open for cook inlet than I think, than I think an onshore plant would leave, uh, in terms of, yes, you're going to have a floating unit. You're going to, you're going to, you know, have a contract with the floating unit to come in and supply a certain amount of price, but those contracts have terms and they have beginning dates and end dates and all sorts of things to them. And if you have a big Cook Inlet find, if somebody's out there and has a Cook Inlet find, uh, then you know you can back off the floating gas and storage unit. All you've done is you put in some extra pipe to be able to uh, to be able to accommodate the receipt of gas from that. But you haven't built a huge amount of onshore kit, uh, and you can accommodate you can accommodate that by backing off the floating gas and storage unit. So it's it's um or the storage and regas unit. So it's um. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a good development and, and one well, sure. that, uh, because NSTAR's, NSTAR's talking about $50 million to build a gasification unit mm -hmm. on shore, right? Isn't no. that, I mean, the, no, 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 no. They're talking about, they're talking about $50 million to build a pipe down oh, to, pipe lot, down to the tidewater, okay. down to Port McKenzie to, uh, to hook up. Okay. So a gasification unit is well beyond that then if they start. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I we're talking billions, probably. Well, it depends whether we can use the Kenai LNG plant, whether they use the Kenai LNG plant if they wanted to turn that into a uh, into an onshore unit. But but it, it, it's giving more. I mean, this whole development is giving more substance to the fact that there isn't a crisis. We've got a solution to the crisis. Thankfully, we've moved on from this. We've got to we've got to subsidize. You know, the Cook Inlet. We got to turn it into a state utility, which is what Walter Featherly, a candidate for the House, uh, argued at one point 
we've got to, you know, to have a state take over the Cook Inlet and produce gas. The state's got to produce the gas to ensure the gas is there. We've moved on from that. We've moved on to realistic market-based solutions that uh, that I think are, uh, are are showing that this crisis isn't really uh, that much of a crisis, that we've got a solution to it and the solutions in the near term. And again, is that maybe, I mean, maybe I wasn't trying to be facetious when I said they didn't want to talk about it because they don't want to alleviate any pressure on the crisis. But do you see that as a potential as to why none of the utilities talked about this? Oh, it could be. I mean, we talked, we, we talked uh, last week about this being Kabuki theater, the whole thing being Kabuki theater, that the utilities wanted to act like, you know, they wanted to stay Alaska gas first. Uh, and wanted to hang on to Alaska gas first, and they didn't want to be the ones that looked like they were that they were advocating bringing in uh, uh, non Alaska gas for a portion of the market uh, to meet their needs. And and maybe this is still part of the Kabuki theater. They want to they want they want somebody else to be out there in front talking about it, uh, talking and and developing the realism of it, and then they'll just sort of slide in behind that. Once everybody sort of accepted that, yeah, we got a solution. It's a realistic solution, not a bad solution. Uh, you know, one we can accommodate and, and go over, right. go forward from there. So in the long run, this is a good thing. Um, obviously, it gives us more options. Uh, and we could wait. Even Brian, Brian says, you know, it's all the things you talked about or the price of natural gas in the Cook Inlet becomes profitable again. One of the, you know, one of those things works. But we've got to have a solution now. And this is a good short term and by short term, I mean ten year, you know, option uh, as we see these things come out, right? Yep, exactly right. And and to Brian's point, it sets a price signal. I mean, part of the problem with the Cook Inlet has been there's an uncertainty about price, right? I mean, we we don't know what the market price is for the Cook Inlet because we don't know what the competitive alternatives are. This will set a a competitive alternative to the Cook Inlet. It will set a, a price marker. We can get gas at this. On the international on the international market at, at x x per MCF or x per MMBTU, we can get this on the international market. Now, is that is that enough of a price signal, Cook Inlet, for you to develop additional supplies? If not, we've got this alternative supply. But if you can bring it in at that price or cheaper, then great. You know, bring bring it on. So it 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 has it has the positive effect of sending a price signal to the Cook Inlet as well. Brad, I look at this thing with the LNG and it to me, this is like this is all great news because we don't have to invest billions and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars into infrastructure. It can truly be a short term solution because you could it's plug and play, right? You bring it up, you plug it in, you use it till you need it. When it's done, you you unhook it and send it on, send it on its merry way. It's not infrastructure on shore that would just then be sitting there doing nothing, you know, once it, it once it goes through. And of course, it gives us the opportunity again. It doesn't. It doesn't short circuit the Cook Inlet, um, uh, and prevent uh, the incentives for new gas discoveries in the Cook Inlet as well. So, I mean, this is all good. This is what we've been talking about for the last year: is that we need some kind of solution like this. People just needed to get off this uh, emotional tie to oh, it should only be Alaska Gas, which. I'm not convinced that for some people it was an emotional tie. I think for some people that they're making that argument because it offends them. And I agree. It's offensive that we got 17 trillion cubic feet of gas and we're not going to be burning our own gas. But at the same time, I also understand the realities of it. I think for some it's, I don't know if I want to use the word insidious, but it's some kind of ploy to, you know, to make, to strengthen their position. Maybe, I don't know. Well, yeah, there were there were all sorts of incentives going on. I mean, for the Cook Inlet producers, if they could get subsidies out of the state uh, in terms of either uh, 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 the state uh, subsidizing their development costs or the state uh, uh, subsidizing their costs by the state foregoing uh, royalty on the production, if the producers could get subsidies out of the state, great. And for the utilities, if they, if they could get the state to subsidize their uh, their gas supply costs by you know, uh, uh, subsidizing the producers and the producers then reducing the price in order to uh, uh, buy that amount in order to supply the state, then great for them as well. I mean, it was all it, it was all about subsidies, right? It was all about let's have the state in here using the state's money or giving away the state's money um, to uh, to subsidize development costs. And Walter Featherly, I mean, went the farthest of any of them saying that, you know, Ada ought to get in there. Ada ought to buy these fields and Ada ought to produce uh, uh, ought to produce the gas. I mean, it was all about 
It was all about getting more, getting money from the state. And, and thankfully we got through this process last legislative session without, without a whole lot of commitment. We've got, we've got a provision in one of the bills that allows ADA to loan money to the producers, but I haven't seen that exercised yet. I haven't seen, you know, somebody actually proposing that ADA give money to X to a given producer uh, on, on these terms. But we got through the legislative session without without subsidies, largely without subsidies. And I think that's a great thing. And now we're going to see what the market does. The market looks like it's going to provide us uh, an answer uh, at a price. And we'll see if that price is is high enough to elicit additional cook inlet production. Um, right. and, and and so we'll, we'll let the market work as opposed to the direction that we started the year at, which was, I forget about the market. We need the state to state to come in and do all this stuff. Well, it's interesting to, uh, it's interesting to watch. And I'm glad to see that there's at least some movement in that direction. Cause you know, of course that effect, that knock on effect of South central gas on pretty much everyone on the rail line um, and on the road system <clears throat> that's connected in one way or another, whether it's the inner tie North or, or down South towards Homer or whatever, it's a big deal. And so I'm hoping that uh, we we see uh, see what's going on. Brad Keithley continues with us. The weekly top three. We're down to number three of the weekly top three, and we're back to this discussion yet again of the permanent fund and this idea that's being floated around. The crisis that was manufactured to create this as an as a scenario, which is the combination and combining of the corpus of the fund, which is untouchable as of right now via the Constitution, to a merging of the corpus of the fund and the earnings reserve account uh, because there's just not enough money in there. Um, And that's become kind of a clarion call for a lot of these people. Again, I think an artificially created crisis where they can justify this. Why? To get their hands on that corpus, to be able to draw directly from it instead of just from the earnings reserve. And to be able to do what the, I've been saying for 20 years, they want to get it's too big a cookie jar for them not to want to get their hands into. Uh, Brad, you, you saying it's coming back around again. What's your thoughts on it this week? Well, I wrote a column uh, last week on the uh, on this whole issue. And the issue is whether the, the the claim that the earnings reserve is so drained that we need to merge the merge the earnings reserve into the permanent fund corpus in order to have enough money to, uh, to, to do the things we want to with, uh, with earnings off of the, off of the permanent fund. And, and the claim was to, to reset the stage, the claim was by the ADN op-ed board, the claim was that the, that the permanent fund dividends paying, paying these huge permanent fund dividends, uh, had drained the earnings reserve down to the point where we need to, we needed to seriously consider merging, merging the two funds together. So my column Friday was to disprove that uh, and to show that that's not that the permanent fund dividends is is not the issue that has that, that's creating this problem. It's the two four billion dollar withdrawals, ad hoc withdrawals that were made in 2020 and 2022 fiscal years 2020 and 2022 that that have drained that have drained out uh, the earnings reserve and brought the earnings reserve to lows and i and and that column was really focused on proving the point that it's not the permanent fund dividend that's done it it's these two ad hoc withdrawals and if you correctly apply the ad hoc withdrawals in the fashion that they were sold they were sold as prepayments of inflation proofing um, if you correctly apply them as prepayments of inflation proofing you don't have an earnings reserve problem at all uh, because what happens is the this eight billion dollars, the two four billion dollar ad hoc withdrawals sit in the permanent fund corpus uh, as prepaid inflation proofing. That means you don't have to make an annual contribution to an inflation proofing until that eight billion dollars is fully amortized. Um, and and so the earnings reserve builds back up, if you will, from those from those two huge withdrawals. The earnings reserve builds back up because you're not having to pay inflation proofing on an annual basis. You've already put all that money into the, uh, into the earnings reserve or into the permanent fund corpus. Um, And so that was the real point of, of, of my column last week. But yesterday I was on problem corner with David, with uh, David Pruse 
And David really developed this. The conversation really went in a different, it sort of took that as a base and then went on and said, well, why are these people doing it? Why are they advocating merging the two together? Um, why have they, why have they, are they using this so-called crisis as a, as a way to, to um, as a way to justify merging the two together? And my answer to that is it's fairly simple. I mean, the only reason you merge the two together is to get at the corpus. Um, you're, you're saying that you're not, you don't have a mo enough money in the earnings reserve to, to pay out what you want to pay out. And so you need to merge the two together and take a percent, uh, in order to get money out of the corpus. That's the only reason you would merge the two, uh, to get money, to get money out of the corpus. And so we, the, the conversation went off much more on, on this is a backdoor way of getting at the permanent fund corpus. This is a backdoor way of cracking open. Uh, the permanent fund corpus and and starting to drain the permanent fund corpus to, you know, to to do the final step of or the next step of we drain the SBR, then we drain the CBR, then we drain permanent fund dividends, and now we're going to crack into the corpus and, and and start draining the corpus. And I it, the more the more we talked about it and the more I've thought about it, this is really a campaign issue. I mean, we've got candidates out there now who are touting Cliff Grow, especially James Kaufman's another one who are touting merging these two funds together as, as, as part of their fiscal solution. And, and that's, it's a bad thing to do because you're cracking om, open the permanent fund corpus. And I, and I think that it's really that this, ha, this is on track to develop into a big campaign issue. Question is, it's a simple question. Do you want to drain the permanent fund corpus? Do you, are you, are you proposing to create mechanisms to drain the permanent fund corpus, and those and 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 to and to and to put Alaska at risk of not having the permanent fund around anymore, and those that are advocating merging the two funds together are doing exactly that. Right. Um, so I think it's I think it's an issue that that needs to get needs to be raised out there and talked about. And, and included on the list of questions you ask candidates. Yeah. Well, because the bottom line is, is that you're, you're basically suggesting that we eat the seed corn. I mean, to dumb it down to the lowest level, the one thing that's funding the largest, largest revenue generation for the state is the earnings of the permanent fund. And if you start tapping into the corpus, which is the core of that earnings potential, you're eating the seed corn. And, you know, even if it's only of uh, two or three hundred million dollars a year that you're drawing it out, you're drawing that down beyond what the permanent fund is earning. It doesn't take long. Um, and based on the 10 year projection of the deficits that we're talking about now, it's not just two or three hundred million a year. We're talking in, you know, we're talking a billion dollars and you start hacking away at that 80 billion dollar fund and then it's 79 and then it's 78 and then it starts to waterfall beyond that with with the with the compounding. Next thing you know, you're taking two or three billion a year out of the corpus of the fund, and it won't be too long to where th there just won't be any money left in there. Yeah, and the whole and the whole thing, that whole scenario, that whole scenario starts with merging the two funds together. It starts with merging the two accounts together, merging the permanent fund corpus and the earnings reserve. Because right now, the way it's set up, if you run through the earnings reserve. We're, we're not going to do that if we apply those prepayments the way they should be. But if you, if you run through the earnings reserve, that's it. You can't go at the corpus. That's the way it's set up right now. So the corpus is always there. It's always producing earnings. Maybe not the level of earnings that you want. Maybe if you want to spend more, you're going to have to raise that money some, some other way. But, but the earnings reserve is a hard stop. This two account approach is a hard stop on, on rating the, uh, rating the, the corpus. You can't, because it's in the constitution, you can't, you can't get at the corpus. If we merge the two accounts together, you've backdoor, you've, you've, you've provided a wide open back door into the corpus. And, and, and yes, you can say, well, it's not that much now. It's, you know, the, we're earning 4%, we'd just be taking 5%. So it's only a percent a year, but you've opened the door. You've opened the door to going from 5% to saying, well, look, we just need the same amount of revenue. We need the same amount of revenue. So, so let's, let's forget the 5% cap. We just need the same amount of revenue coming out of the, coming out of the permanent fund that, that we've had. And maybe if you have a bad earnings year,
maybe that 6% or 7% or 8%. And then, you know, it's not that much to say, well, we need, we need that revenue inflation adjusted. We need more revenue to, to offset, you know, the drop and all. And, and you can see, you can see once this door is opened, you can see a path to draining the permanent fund corpus fairly quickly. Yeah. Uh, They've never seen a dollar. They never seen a dollar. They didn't want to spend Brad less than we've got about 90 seconds here. So I think it's a campaign issue. I think it's a legitimate question for Jesse Bjorkman. I think it's a le legit, legitimate question for James Kaufman. I think it's a legitimate question for Cliff Grow. Are you advocating merging those two accounts? And and if so, then you are advocating creating a backdoor into the corpus. And I think that's a legitimate campaign issue to push to 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 press these people on. No, I mean I would agree. It's something we haven't talked about uh, in large uh, up until this point, but I think it's definitely something that we should include in our future discussions. Brad, I mean I hate to be the guy that said I told you so, but 1999, 2000, I was talking about this. With at the time, John Coghill, who was one of the most conservative representatives in the legislature at the time. At the time. At the time. He was, I mean, this is a guy that stood outside the caucus, right? He wouldn't, he wouldn't join a caucus. He was, he was adamant about it and everything else. And then all of a sudden there was kind of this flip-flopping, and all of a sudden he was one of the ones behind, <clears throat> excuse me, that first run at the permanent fund back in the day. Uh, remember when the people voted on it, it was 82% right. opposed. But he was one of the ones that was advocating for this. And I was like, John, this is a this is going to give you access, you know, eventually to the perm. Oh, no, it's, you know, and, and this is this is what the whole thing has been about the whole time that at the time it was only 60 billion, I think, at the time or 58 billion or something. I mean, it was like it was still a lot of money, but they're all. But I could say this is just the next cookie jar. We've already seen what you want to do. You want to get more. And this is what's been going on for 25 years. This has been the ultimate end game for many of these legislators for the last 20 years. Yeah, it's it's clear. I mean, now we have the, the benefit of looking back on the last decade, right? And, and draining the statutory budget reserve, the SBR, draining the constitutional budget reserve, the CBR, net, draining the, the permanent fund dividend, basically, uh, by, by deeper and deeper and deeper cuts in that. And... And these guys, <laughs> they're not going to stop. I mean, um, if you look forward the next decade, if you look at the the, the, the Department of Revenue's uh, budget forecast, revenue forecast, um, spending continues to grow, but oil revenues stay uh, stay flat. And so, where's that additional revenue going to come from uh, once you've uh, once you've drained the permanent fund dividend, which we're on track to do? Where's that additional revenue going to come from? And, and the Binkleys are going to tell you, it ain't going to come from us. <laughs> it's, it's time to crack in. It's time to, to, to you know, merge those two, two accounts together and start giving us access to the permanent fund corpus. And that's just the next thing down the road. So we've seen, we've seen, we've seen this movie. We've seen where this goes with the S, draining the SBR, draining the CBR, draining the permanent fund dividend now. We've seen what this movie, what, what this movie is. And shame on us. If, if we don't say, wait, you know, we got a way of stopping this, which is to keep the two accounts as they are, to keep that hard stop that the, that the, that the two account system gives to keep the accounts where we are. Well, Shame on us if we, if we don't, if we don't, you know, enforce that hard stop. And to stop the accounting gimmicks, right? I mean, not only did we transfer $8 billion over to the corpus, it was supposedly pre-inflation proofing that we should be accounting for as inflation proofing until it runs out. But also the fact that they're not accounting for all the dollars that are actually in the earnings reserve. They're accounting for the deficits, but they're not accounting for the, uh, you know, for the for the debits, but they're not accounting for the deposits in the fund moving forward. Oh, it's only got this much. Well, that's sure. If you only count, this is the same thing Bill Walker did, right? That's the same thing when he said, well, we just don't have any. Well, you're only counting the, de you're only counting withdrawals, not the future deposits that are going to be coming in as well. The, all these numbers, the numbers are true in and of themselves. And if you take it out, this is how much will be in there. But that's if you don't account for how much money is going to be deposited in the future as well. It's right. a half, it's a half truth. And yeah. those are the worst kind because they've got a kernel of truth in them, but you're not getting the full picture. And that's how they do this. They basically yeah. do it through omission and innuendo. And people start to panic because they don't they're not taking the time to figure this stuff out.
Yeah, it's it's all it, it's all being painted for a reason, you know, forgetting about the prepayments and 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 not counting them as prepayments and and then saying the earnings reserve is drained as a result of that. Uh, uh, and and the accounting mechanism that you're talking about the uh, the 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 advance accounting on costs or, or on spending, but not the advance accounting on revenues. Uh, all of that is to is to portray the earnings reserve in a very bad light, in the worst possible light you can get it, uh, and that's for the purpose of supporting this this run on the on the two account system because. Oh, the earnings reserve is gone. We're not going to have money. We need to do something about that. Let's let's crack open the let's crack open access to the corpus to 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 keep it going. And it won't be much. I mean, we, we won't take much. Sounds like the yeah. early days of the raid on the SBR and the CBR. We right. won't take much. Uh, but but they will. It, once you get, I mean, what the last decade has shown us shown shown us is that once you give them access to something, it will keep going. There will be more and more right. and more reasons well, to spend and, le- and and fewer constraints on on stopping that spending. You know what we're not even talking about? We've talked about it occasionally on the show, but that nobody's talking about it anymore. The fact that we have a constitutional obligation to repay the CBR. It's $10 billion, right? I mean, I think we still owe it $9 billion now. It's got about a billion in it or just under a billion. I mean, we have a constitutional obligation. And in fact, uh, uh, was it Jesse Keel or something? They proposed basically reversing the Constitution so we wouldn't have to pay it back. If that doesn't tell you everything you need to know right there, I mean, that's a problem. But we're not even talking about that, let alone tapping into the permanent fund. Yeah. So we're, we're not serious about living within our means in the state. That's the final thought. Brad, uh, 20 seconds here. We've got to we've got to ask candidates what their position is on this. This has got to become an issue because they're going to make a run at it next legislative session, and we got to know where these candidates are uh, in, in this election cycle. Sure, uh, it'll be this. It'll be the. Uh, it'll be the. Whoops! It'll be the. Uh, uh, it'll be the 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 new run at the BSA. It'll be defined benefits. All these things are coming together all at once, and it's going to be painful to watch. All right, Brad Keithley. My friend, thank you. It's been fun. Michael, thanks for having me. We'll see you tomorrow, my friend. We'll see you next week. Thanks for coming in. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.